another edition of the Eco Review. This is a live, hour-long journal focused on environmental factors, um, events, and news impacting all of us in California and well out across the web reach. Uh, you know, we do stream live on the internet now, and you're able to get your friends who don't have a TV. I never watch that thing. Well, you can have them watch. It's just www.communitytv.org backslash ctv3 you'll see that address so let them know this is a program they're going to want to see and make sure their friends see it's uh, really exciting to have our guests tonight i'm going to get right to introductions here and share with you um, i think a lot of our viewers will remember back in november we were fortunate enough to connect with um, expert witness and nuclear engineer arnie gunderson of fairwinds and associates and Arnie uh, has done just yeoman's work in keeping us abreast of developments in Japan, uh, information TEPCO and Japanese government wasn't uh, making available for us, and uh, really the, the core uh, components, if you will, for uh, nuclear power and how they go awry even when uh, they're invented or designed and developed by supposed and, and and expert peoples. So we have Arnie back on tonight. He's going to be talking with us for uh, updates on Fukushima and something a whole lot closer to home. And um, we'll get into that shortly in the program, but I'm also delighted to have in, in the studio with me tonight, uh, David Bloom. A lot of our viewers will recognize Dave. He's been on the program before. It takes time to come in and fill us in on things that he's working on. And Dave, there is a, a real intersection here between um, you and Fukushima. I know George Nuri of Coast to Coast AM had you on last year repeatedly to give updates on developments there. Well, yes, Tom. Uh, we scientists, you know, all kind of uh, get on the phone and talk to each other. And my uh, colleagues in Japan were saying, you guys are not hearing the whole story. So, you know, I was uh, doing my best to transmit on the ground information to the American media, which, you know, was kind of negligent in getting the word out to people. And, you know, there is, there is no over the fence. You know, everyone is downwind of everyone else. And so you couldn't really say that, ah, oh, it's Japan's problem. Because if it's Japan's problem, it's our problem. Winds circle the globe and so do the ocean. So, you know, it was important for us to know what really was going on there and what wasn't being told either to the Japanese or to the Americans. Uh, Arnie, are you on there with us? Can you hear me this evening? I can hear you crystal clear. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure to reconnect with you. And I, uh, you know, I, I don't know that you've had a chance to talk with David, but I really look forward to the exchange and dialogue between the two of you as, as the scientists and experts in, in tonight's program. And the work that you have done and you and Maggie and Fairwinds have been dedicated to here in the last year is just really exciting. I am sure there must be some incredible pressures on you to maybe discontinue this uh, course of research. It's, it's probably one of those things that uh, you don't get a lot of governmental sort of support for doing. Is that correct? Well, you know, when, when the accident at Fukushima Daiichi happened, I said, I am not going to let this get covered up. Um, and, uh, you know, our business, the, the, the billable portion of our business dropped way off. But I just thought it was so important for the world that just had the story had to come out and had to come out consistently for a long enough period of time. Uh, because, yeah, you're right. Mainstream media was uh, was covering it up. And, you know, it's interesting because I think there is an intersection between what David and I are doing. The, uh, the book I wrote on um, in Japanese in Japan is called Fukushima Daiichi, the truth, which talks about the accident and the future which talks about the fact that there are alternatives and we don't have to build more nuclear plants to satisfy our energy demand. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Oh, excellent. Well, let's get right to uh, some of this. And I'm going to remind our viewers real quickly, you'll see the phone number up here. It's 425-8844 and area code 831. Uh, we do welcome or invite your question or call, but um, Arnie, what have you seen recently? Because Dave and I uh, have both seen different pieces of news about Fukushima. But what, what's most 
do you think is be being uh, covered up the best and is most important for us to recognize? Is it is it all done? Everything clean up now? The uh, on the on the Daiichi site, the, the worst problem is Unit Four and the fuel pool issues there. Um, through two Japanese ambassadors, uh, they've finally gotten some worldwide attention. Uh, Bob Alvarez, Gordon Edwards, and I have been working with uh, Ambassador Akio Matsumura for over a year now. And finally, uh, the world understands that, uh, that, that Unit 4 um, actually uh, still has the potential to create an even worse accident than what we experienced a year ago. So now Tokyo Electric is finally beginning to say um, what we've been saying now for over a year, and that's that you've got to get the fuel out of Unit 4 just as quickly as possible. Unit 3 isn't too far behind. It's kind of interesting. Nobody talks about Unit 3, but it had a one-third full core offload, so there was uh, quite a lot of hot nuclear fuel in Unit 3's fuel pool, too. So, no, the, the site isn't out of the woods. But the, the other problem, of course, is uh, Tokyo Electric doesn't have the money, and the Japanese government is drizzling it out, as opposed to admitting that this is going to be a half a, a, a half a trillion U.S., which is something on the order of 30 trillion yen or something like that. It's a big number. Uh, the, uh, uh, instead of admitting it and, and, and having the Japanese people know that in the long haul they're going to spend an enormous amount of money cleaning this up, they drizzle it out every six months. They say, well, here's another uh, 20 or 30 billion. But in fact, it's going to be a huge amount of money that the Japanese are going to have to eat. And the last thing is the um, contamination throughout Japan um, on the ground. Mm. We're finding um, house contamination in the form of household dust at extraordinarily high levels. Um, People are sending us their vacuum cleaner bags from, from Fukushima Prefecture. That's as, brilliant. As far as uh, 100 kilometers or 60 miles away, we're finding tens of thousands of disintegrations per second in a, in a kilogram ba vacuum cleaner bag. So household dust, and of course the internal exposure that comes from it, uh, is something that the Japanese government is not talking about either. Yeah, it, it is electrifying to think that uh, you, this has been dismissed by the media. You don't see that as a concern anywhere. But uh, there were a couple of things you mentioned earlier uh, to me uh, today about uh, effects of earthquake perhaps wear on, on the reactor uh, itself. And I'm also thinking about something that Dave told me the other day, which was some uh, a story about a boat recently up on uh that had come up on vancouver vancouver island the yeah. Yeah, british columbia coast yeah well go ahead with the i'll talk to you about the the condition of that building um the the unit four you know it, it's obvious it's a mess i mean if you look at it it, it blew up um and tokyo <laughs> electric has been saying no it's just fine although just recently they um They've acknowledged that it's a uh, it's bulging in the middle, um, and it's interesting too because where that bulge is located uh, indicates it's something called a first mode Euler strut defect, and that means it's likely a seismic problem that came with the uh, with the initial earthquake or perhaps one of the ones after that. So the the net effect of this is that the uh, the building has no containment. Um, all this nuclear fuel, hot nuclear fuel, in the fuel pool and is bulging on the sides. And uh, yet Tokyo Electric had a plan that was going to take four years to, uh, uh, to remove the fuel. I mean, my God, we won World War II in less time than it's going to take them to defuel that uh, reactor. Well, you know, as Arnie points out, this pool is already showing signs of, of uh, failure. But, you know, in the United States, we have more room than they have in Japan. They have a lot of people in a small space. So when they designed that nuclear power plant, they didn't have a place on the ground to put the spent fuel or the waiting fuel in water in a pool on the ground. So this pool is over 100 feet above the ground on top of the building. Now, you got to realize that nuclear metal, you know, is incredibly dense and incredibly heavy 
And um, the amount of weight up there that's being held on the racks, you know, holding all these rods up there, is an enormous amount of tonnage. And the way that they have to remove that fuel, no one really knows how to do yet because you can't ever let it get exposed to air or burst into flame. So they're going to have to somehow remove the racks of fuel rods, keep them immersed with a crane lifting this megatonnage of fuel rods somehow in water to get it down to somewhere that they think they can do something with. No one has ever done anything like this before. No one really knows how to do it yet. So that's why they're saying, well, it's going to take four years because we don't know how to do it yet. Sounds like we should call David Copperfield or something. He's probably got an idea about how you, you pull off a contortion like that. Is that something that, you, uh, that they even think about in the design stage of these plants, Arnie? Is that something that, that they take into consideration? Let's put the, the pool above ground. Is that, I mean... Well, <clears throat> There's uh, these. There's 23 plants in the U.S. that have the same problem, but the other 80 do not. So we learned this first generation plant uh, putting that that fuel way up in the air like that was a mistake. And the remaining 80 plants in the U.S. after we built those 23 have that uh, fuel pool much much lower and in a much more protected spot. And uh, and it's actually worse in the United States because the Japanese only put seven or eight years of nuclear fuel in their fuel pool. And uh, in the States, our, our fuel pools have more than 30 years of nuclear fuel in the pool. So uh, if there were to be a problem in a U.S. pool, um, it would release even more radiation than we're afraid will come out of Fukushima. Well, you know, uh, it's interesting where we're sliding the U.S. story in here in a, uh, a bit, and I think a lot of people here in California, guy, it's a beautiful day, we're in summer, you know, the gardens are going, and it's really easy to get distracted at the beach or something, but um, there was two weeks ago a really interesting short little AP clip that I, I came across that was talking about, and that's actually why I wrote you, Arnie, and, and uh, was wondering if you'd be available to talk because there was this little clip I'd seen about uh, 1,200 cooling rods being uh, failing at uh, San Onofre. And um, that's where I think we, we should go maybe with the conversation. And we do have a video clip, um, a little uh, experiment that you just ran down there on site. And why don't you tell us just uh, uh, real briefly how you set the clip up and then we'll go to the clip and share that with our viewers. Well, I, I was hired by Friends of the Earth to figure out why these, uh, these tubes inside the steam generator were failing. Um, and it's, it's, you can see these very complicated engineering drawings. And, and frankly, I thought we needed a better way of explaining what a U-tube steam generator looked like. So we put this video together on the beach and we simulated U-tubes. And I got to show how, on, um, how they were banging into each other and causing the problems that is happening at San Onofre today. Awesome. Well, let's go to that clip and we'll come right back to you uh, as soon as that's run. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. And today I'm at the San Onofre nuclear plant that's in the background. Uh, San Onofre is presently shut down. Uh, it has steam generator leaks. And I wanted to give this demonstration today to talk about what it is exactly that a steam generator does and how they can leak. Well, this blue thing around me represents the key component in the, in the side of the, the steam generator. And it's called the tube sheet. It's two feet thick, solid steel, and 13 feet wide. So that's just about the shape and size of, of what I'm standing inside of. Now this would be a solid piece of steel before it's fabricated. Weighs about 100 tons, it's enormous. Now, first thing they do is they drill holes into this tube sheet. They drill 9,700 holes on this side and 9,700 holes on this side. What happens then is when they put the steam generator together, hot water comes from the nuclear reactor, and that's symbolized by this orange pipe. So hot water would go through that 
It's actually 32 inches in diameter and a quarter of a million gallons every minute comes in. It comes in the bottom and goes up through these tubes, crosses over and comes down on this side. Now where I'm standing is not the radioactive side. I'm standing on the non-radioactive side. Radioactive water is inside these and hot steam and hot water is where I'm standing. Now, if you notice, these things are shaped like U's. That's why it's called a U-tube steam generator. The pipes come in, cross over, and come back in the shape of a U. Now, we've modeled up three tubes here. In fact, there would be 9,700 tubes on this side, and each one would cross over into 9,700 tubes on this side. When San Onofre decided to rebuild their steam generators, they made a design change, and I believe that it's that design change that's causing the tubes to fail inside. Right where I'm standing, right in the middle of this tube sheet, down below was a massive pillar. It was called a stay cylinder. San Onofre decided to get rid of that massive pillar down below to cram more tubes into the steam generator. Instead of 9,300, they got 9,700 tubes. By removing the place right below me, more tubes meant they could get more heat out and more electricity out. But it also changed the flow inside the nuclear steam generator. What's happening in San Onofre now is that these tubes are vibrating. And they're colliding with the pipes, with the pieces of metal that are designed to keep them separated. The vibrating... Arnie, um, we're, we're watching this clip that you just shot down at uh, San Onofre, and uh, we're, we're getting to a really critical point in it where you're talking about how the vibrating of these uh, tubes um, probably punctured and has caused sort of a, a laser-like cutting reaction to occur. It, um, I'm wondering, uh, while we're bringing that clip back together, perhaps, uh, we're, we're wondering if you could explain a little bit more about what your, your um, theory is on how the damage was caused by that single pipe, ruptured pipe, and how that impacted the 1300 coils that all were taken offline. Well, actually, uh, although uh, Edison went after me vociferously, uh, I was proven right. Uh, the, the reports we wrote that are up on the Fairwinds website um, were, were proven right just last week by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. What happened was this. Um, Edison didn't build the same steam generator that was there. They really tried to juice it up and in the process, they screwed it up. They, they created a spot, like a sweet spot, inside the, uh, all these tubes that was pure steam. And that, no one ever planned on that happening. And in that pure steam, the tubes were banging together and damaging each other. Now, one happened to leak, but uh, quite a few others were, uh, were severely damaged by all this, this banging. Now, the, the NRC said that Edison could hear the tubes banging with something called the loose parts monitor and ignored it for, for 10 months. So um, there's lots of problems here that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission isn't addressing. How the computer com pro programs were ever qualified to do this kind of design, it, this, it never, they had a 400% error in their computer programs. Wow. How the loose parts monitoring heard the pipes rattling and Edison didn't do anything about it. On and on and on. Um, but the, the biggest problem here, and I'll be, bri I'll be brief, was that the, um, the, they plugged uh, 1,300 tubes. They didn't need to plug uh, that many. They only needed to plug 10. And so the question is, if they needed to plug 10, why did they plug 1,300? And again, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is not telling the truth here. The real reason is that something called a steam line break accident. If there had been a steam line break accident, all of these tubes that were damaged because they were vibrating together 
would have popped like popcorn and released enormous amounts of radiation, not inside the containment, but it would have gotten outside the containment. Mm. So it would have been a much worse accident than Southern California was ever prepared for. Um, so it was bad news, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission really isn't talking about it yet. Well, you know, uh, as Arnie would, would uh, verify, the pressure inside these tubes is incredible because that's how you keep the, um, the steam from going super critical. So when there's a leak in one of these tubes, it's just like a, a, some kind of cutting torch. Uh, you know, for instance, on nuclear-powered ships, when there's a steam leak, which is fairly comparable, you take a broom and you swing it in front of yourself one way and then the other way, and when it gets cut off, that's how you find the leak. You can't see the leak coming across the room. It's invisible, but it's so high pressure, it can cut through most everything. In fact, it could cut through metal, like it could cut through tubes next door. So if you start getting leaks in some of these tubes, it's pretty hard to model how much damage they could do in minutes after they start to leak. Well, what would be the probable cause for the original puncture that starts that leak, Arnie? Uh, they were crashing into each other. Uh, they were vibrating to wow. the point where they just totally damaged each other. And that's um, because they didn't bother with the, the, uh, the center stay? Well, yeah, because they put too many tubes in in the first place. That created too much heat in the center of this tube sheet. And with too much heat in the center and not enough heat on the outside, they got a steam bubble that floated up in the tubes, allowing the tubes to collide with each other. And, uh, uh, you know, Edison brought this on themselves. They, they could have built the same steam generator that lasted 30 years, and instead they went out and they came up with an entirely new design and they said they wanted this one to run 60. So they were planning on running this plant for 90 years with these steam generators in it. And no nuclear power plant as an overall design is, is meant to last that long. I mean 40 years is really about it and then you're starting to talk about more and more things going wrong until you shut the thing down. So a lot of these plants were expected to run for 30 or 40 years, and then they expected them to be decommissioned. And so it's kind of like in the case of Fukushima. Well, what are the chances of an earthquake and a tidal wave happening in the next 40 years? We'll have this thing taken down and out of here by the time there's ever a disaster. Well, you know, they've extended the licenses, extended the licenses way beyond the design life of this stuff. And at the same time, nature has proven that it can be pretty unpredictable you know, and that things do happen. Um, you know, they, we have many examples of this in the past, and um, there was one in Russia called Chelyabinsk way back in the late 50s, where uh, they had buried a bunch of waste in casks underground, but they had lost track of where they had had them. And so the heat radiating from, all the radi from each cask caused a steam explosion which spewed the radiation up into the atmosphere and it rained for you know many many square miles all around it and that area is still completely uninhabitable today but the CIA said oh we don't want to tell Americans about that because they might be against nuclear power if they heard about it so the whole one of the biggest nuclear accidents on the planet much bigger than Chernobyl was completely covered up because gosh, you know, we really need this nuclear power. Or I should say nuclear industrialists need this nuclear power. There's, a, there's another one that was covered up by the United States government, and that was right outside of L.A. Uh, right outside of L.A., there was a reactor uh, in the late 50s, same time span, called uh, Santa Susana. And it had a meltdown, and it didn't have a containment building. Uh, they are, there, there are many square miles outside of L.A. that are contaminated even to this day, and they really don't know how to ever clean up that site. There's a lot of evidence of cancers in the uh, surrounding communities. And again, the, the, uh, the government tried for years to cover this up until about 1990, when uh, the cancers just, uh, you know, just pointed a finger back toward the Santa Susana reactor. So, yeah, we, uh, we have a storied history of uh, uh, not telling the truth when we have nuclear accidents. Well, that's, a, that's amazing. I mean, Washington State has uh, that whole decommissioned or, or uh, de deactivated, I guess, plant uh, that you can't get within miles of. 
and they're, they're still trying to figure out how they're going to uh, get rid of the waste from the site. They can't move it. Uh, you've got, what would happen theoretically if, if this uh, event at San Onofre would, would have uh, continued? Well, I have a comment about that, Tom, because you know, they all say that nuclear power, you know, it's so great because in one station you can produce so much electricity and serve so many people. How can you compare that to any other kind of energy? But in the case of this Los Angeles plant, San Onofre, uh, it only serves one and a half million people with its electricity. But if this tube accident continued and the thing melted down and blew, it could kill seven and a half million people. So the whole myth that a nuclear power plant just puts out so much energy that it takes care of a huge part of the United States is completely a myth. More people would be damaged than the people served by the electricity in the case of San Onofre. Incredible. Yeah. You know, we, on, on, the, on the San Onofre issue, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the, uh, the service district is quite small, but, uh, you know, we said it at the very beginning of the, 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 the piece here. Uh, the, everybody's downwind from these plants. It's not, uh, it doesn't stop at the site boundary, that's for sure. You can have 40 great years and one bad day. <laughs> Yeah. And, just and takes it, one it, bad day. Yeah. And it, it, well, that's the thing that really irritates me is it seems like the science doesn't even try and design for that bad day. It's kind of like rather than design for it, it's, it's uh, the, well, let's just put the picture up in front of that window and don't look out there because, you know, we can't do anything about it. If that day came, oh, well. You know. Well, I, I, I don't completely agree with that, Tom, because I do know nuclear safety engineers. And these guys write protocol after protocol to try to do what they can to keep these plants safe. But they're the first to tell you that this is one great big engineering nightmare, the whole thing is. It's like the purpose of nuclear power plants was originally not to make electricity. It was to provide nuclear material for a weapons program. The people who used to regulate the nuclear industry used to be the Department of Defense. So the purpose of these plants were to make nuclear bomb material and electricity and steam were the byproduct. So, you know, after we had all the nuclear weapons we needed, well, now it became a business, you know, to produce electricity with them, but it's never been cost effective. It's the most expensive electricity we have. You know, the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists did a study that said that, in fact, Nuclear is about twice as expensive, as expensive as what we're paying for it because of all the subsidies for the last 70 years. Instead of five cents, it should be 10, essentially. Uh, so, uh, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. If you take the subsidies off the table, uh, a lot of renewables uh, come, come to the surface as being much more viable. And that doesn't even... That doesn't even include, you know, hanging on to the nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years. Well, you mean four and a half billion years. It's only acutely toxic for 250,000, <laughs> but it continues to be toxic for billions of years. But, you know, if you think about Love Canal, right, this was the chemical dump up in the northeast. And, you know, after a while, they paved it over. And it sat there for a while, and developers came along and said, wow, look at that great place to put a bunch of houses. And they built a whole neighborhood on top of it. They couldn't even keep track of chemical waste for a generation. How are we going to keep track of nuclear waste for 250,000 years? It just isn't going to happen. But the corporation that made the money on that plant will be long gone by then. Uh, you, you touched on something interesting, Arnie, which is subsidies. And um, this, kind of, this kind of steps outside of just looking at nuclear energy. But it, isn't it interesting that the only subsidies that they seem to be able to curtail or cut altogether are those going to renewable energy, biofuels, you know, the uh, um, bioethanol and alcohol fuel, losing all the federal subsidies and incentives this year. Are, how, how can that be? You know, and those are fractional uh, on, on a dollar sort of subsidies when you compare them to what petroleum industry or what nuclear industry, and I guess do you have figures for what the subsidies are in the nuclear uh, industry? Or we know them from petroleum and stuff, but do you know what they would kind of amount to? Well, uh, Union of Concerned Scientists has a paper up on their website that, that details it. 
But basically the cost at the bus bars, it leaves the power plant that we think we're paying is five cents and it really should be 10 cents. So essentially uh -huh. your electric bill, which is probably 13 or 14 cents, really should be 20 cents if we factored in all of those subsidies. But and you know, I couldn't agree with you more. The nuclear industry has, through the Department of Energy, gets enormous subsidies and now we're on to thorium reactors and small modular reactors and advanced power reactors. The, um, the government funded a, an organization called New Start, whose purpose was to uh, get the uh, advanced reactors up and running that are going on in Georgia. And they, we were actually, through our tax dollars, paying New Start and New Start's attorneys to prevent the public from being involved in the process. So public money went to a, a to private def corporation to prevent the public from participating in the licensing process. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. Well, you know, <laughs> this, this whole thing is so unnecessary, too, because basically nuclear power and oil and coal, they're all based on things that eventually run out. You know, and so whatever, well, whoever controls the limited amount of those things makes the money. And so there's a real vested interest in industries to use things that run out because they can make way more money on something where it has an unlimited supply, which is like solar energy. Now, uh, you know, Arnie may agree with me on this, which is we're actually both very much in favor of nuclear power, although it doesn't sound like it. But the thing is, where do you put a nuclear power plant? The answer is there is a right place to put it in relation to people and that's 92 million miles away. It's called the sun, okay? So when the nuclear power plant is that far away, you don't even need a containment vessel, okay? So the energy coming from the sun is something we're gonna have for four and a half billion years. In fact, well, that's about as long as some nuclear waste lasts. So, so when the sun burns out, yes, we have other problems, you know? But until then, solar energy is this annoying thing to corporations because no one has to directly pay for it. It falls everywhere. There's no channeling it or collecting it or keeping people away from it. So here we are talking about 20, 40, 50 cent a kilowatt electricity from these um, you know, advanced nuclear power plants. And yet uh, some people in the world pay that amount for electricity right now from oil. Uh, you know, I'm working on a project in Latin America where this major city is running on bunker oil, in other words, the worst diesel oil you can get, and they're paying, you know, 20, 30 cents a kilowatt for the electricity. We're working with them to go ahead and start going to solutions to this problem. So we're going ahead and making alcohol, which we can then use to run a generator, the same generator that's running on diesel fuel right now, for 10 cents a kilowatt. And, you know, I've got a long history with this. Back during the Diablo Canyon protests, I sent down some of my staff from my alcohol fuel company with a big six-cylinder generator on the back running on alcohol, and we had a big sign that says, Diablo Canyon power, 10 cents a kilowatt, this alcohol power, 3 cents a kilowatt. Even in the little generator that we were doing, <laughs> they're running the emergency medical, you know, uh, center for all the protesters. So, you know, it's been true for a long time that nuclear power isn't economical, but it is a great giveaway program to major corporations. Now, the subsidies thing just drives me up the wall. You know, our, our wonderful Senator Dianne Feinstein uh, married uh, Oklahoma oil Senator Tom Coburn and said, oh, we can't afford alcohol fuel subsidies because we have a deficit going on and all that. And they got, for the first time, since Republicans have tried to get rid of this, you know, subsidy, they finally succeeded after, like, since Jimmy Carter, so that's decades. So, but there's a difference between nuclear subsidies and oil subsidies and renewable subsidies. In the case of alcohol fuel, because we make it in this country from our sunlight, right? Carbohydrates come from the sun, and we make those into alcohol. When, we, when someone buys a dollar of alcohol here in the US, it generates $3 in tax revenues. So for every dollar of subsidy, sorry, every dollar of subsidy, not dollar of purchase, it creates three new dollars of taxable events because all the parts of the plant are made here, all the people who work on the plant are here, and so they spend their money here. Uh, you know, all that cycles back into the economy, which creates tax revenue. So in the towns in the Midwest where there are alcohol plants, the pools are open, the libraries are open, 
All the public services are happening because taxes are being paid. We, when we pay for oil or nuclear subsidies, that's money flushed down the, wherever you're flushing it permanently. It just goes away. It's like military spending. So uh, when we do renewables, we are using something that is American, sun falling our place, and it's made by people doing work that can't be outsourced. The sunlight falls here, you know, and it's not something that we can ignore as an incredibly important part of our economy, much less, you know, ignore it from the environment. I mean, you're talking about stuff in nuclear power plants where a tablespoon of that fuel, if you distributed it equally to all the people in the world, would kill every one of them. You only need a couple of atoms of plutonium in your lungs to guarantee your death. So when we're talking about Fukushima and we're talking about what happens if the, the, the fuel from number four cooling pond falls on the ground when the building falls over and explodes into fire, we're talking about the winds of the earth carrying death around the northern hemisphere. This is, this is not a small localized event. This is something that everyone in the northern airspace has a say in or should. That's phenomenal. Arnie, are, are, um, are you as concerned? Dan Hirsch, when he was on our program back in April last year, um, was talking about the top 10 list in the US. And it's easy to get to you know, think, oh, this is Japan's problem or Chernobyl's, Russia's problem. He had India Point and uh, San Onofre right up there at the top of the list, but are, are those things, are there places beyond LA that you're looking with concern right now? Well, I've said that there's um, the 23 nukes that are just like Fukushima Daiichi should be shut down. Th that means there's still 80 running, but those 23 are just too similar and too weak uh, to continue operation. But even uh, if you shut them down, you, you can't, it's not like a light switch, right? I mean, you can't just turn right. that off and everything's great and you can just go, right. how do you do that? How do you well, shut them down? Well, you've got to get the fuel out of the pools and into dry cask storage, which is an air-cooled storage that sits on the ground. Now, Fukushima Daiichi had dry cask storage and all the dry casks survived the earthquake and the tsunami just fine. So the, the biggest problem facing uh, the United States right now is to get all of the fuel out of the pools and onto the ground in these dry cast storage. The reason we're not doing it because the industry doesn't want to spend the money and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is letting them get away with it. But to get back to your question about Dan, yeah, there's, uh, in addition to the 23 BWRs that are identical to Fukushima, the two most dangerous plants in the country um, uh, are San Onofre, and Indian Point because of emergency planning and their age. Uh, we've learned a lot more about seismic issues at San Onofre and Indian Point. They're both near enormous concentrations of people. So the, the, the combination of the probability of an accident being greater than we anticipated and the population has grown around these nuclear plants for 40 years, that, that's a double whammy and, and I don't think those licenses should be, uh, should be extended. The, the other one that scares me is down in, um, uh, at, at the Oconee units in uh, South Carolina. Uh, right upstream from them is a, uh, is a huge hydroelectric dam. Now, hydroelectric oh. dams don't fail very often, but you don't get tsunamis off of Japan very often either. And if that hydroelectric dam were to fail, um, it would produce about a 50-foot wave that come right over that nuclear uh, facility. And yet the NRC said, well, the probability of that dam failing is low, so therefore we're not going to worry about it. And, you know, Dan, Dan said before, they, to my mind, the key is that engineers design really well for the design bases. Now, you tell them that an earthquake will be a seven, they'll build a plant to withstand a seven. The problem is that, that Mother Nature doesn't believe in design bases. And sooner or later, you get an eight or a nine or a, a 65 foot tsunami or a dam breaking, and the engineers didn't design for it, and the building fails. Well, then again, of course, Arnie, I think, I think actually this is a quote from you, which is never use the word sandbags and nuclear power in the same sentence. <laughs> you know, uh, but, uh, you know, totally not talked about in the press were the two plants 
on the Mississippi River, gosh, they're next to water again, you know, like yeah. Fukushima, that were undergoing flooding at the same time Fukushima was in the news. And you saw pictures of the nuclear power plant inside a little dam, almost looking like it's floating in the river while the river had come up around it. It's like anywhere you put a nuclear power plant, it's pretty close to the water level of where it is. They don't pump the water uphill very far. You know, the plant is right there next to the, you know, next to the water source. So you got places like the one in the Philippines where there's a nuclear power plant at the foot of a volcano on an earthquake fault <laughs> with a V-shaped valley that no. would focus a 20-foot tsunami to become 80 feet by the time it reached the plant. It's like, who approved that one, you know? <laughs> But the whole point is we don't have to do these things. Yeah. We have sources of energy right now that are very practical uh, and can replace electricity uh, totally economically, uh, especially in other parts of the world that don't have big centralized power stations. You know, in the United States, we have big hydro plants, we've got coal burning, we've got big natural gas plants, and we've got these nuclear power plants that feed a grid. Well. We have about 300 million people, so that kind of makes sense. But then you look at Ethiopia. It has 120 million people, about you know, close to a third of the United States, a little more. No grid, no roads to 60% of the villages, and they need electricity. It's all generators. You know, so how do you fix it for the rest of the world? Well, you have to replace the fossil fuel that those generators are running on with something that's clean, and that would be alcohol fuel, which is based on solar energy. Uh, we look at around the world people doing uh, electrical generation with fossil fuels, and we don't, we are not associated very well with that in the United States, that most of the world isn't talking about um, pollution from uh, nuclear waste or nuclear fuel, they're talking about real, honest to God, air pollution from burning fossil fuels for electricity. So we have many levels of replacing electricity we need to go to, but nuclear power plant is, uh, you know, basically a, a Rube Goldberg idea that only could get sold in an industrialized country where they have people selling the machinery to go into them. Other places can't even consider nuclear, and I guess that's to their benefit, but when you take a look at the air pollution problems in other countries, it's enormous. And nuclear power, you know, I mean, although we have all electric homes in the U.S., which are nuclear powered, in most of the world, half the people in the world cook over wood or charcoal or kerosene mm. inside their, their house with three rocks in a pot. So half the world has no use for nuclear power, even for cooking. And those people are dying from inhalation of fossil fuel or wood smoke. Those people could be using alcohol, which is practically pollution-free and safe to use indoors. So, you know, you start looking at the nuclear thing in the whole world context, and you go, well, it doesn't apply to most of the people in the world. Why are we doing it anywhere? Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is because we can, because, the, you know, the engineers said we could build this cool thing, but, you know, we really can't. You know, when you start boiling water in, a, uh, in any kind of boiler, things wear out, you know, and if they wear out in a nuclear power plant, it's really bad. It's like the difference between a car accident and your engine wearing out and being in a plane and the engine running out. You know, there's a big <laughs> difference between something wearing out, and nuclear power is way too risky. Arnie, I know on, on your site you've got uh, a lot of really important clips, experiments that you've run, Fairwinds Associates, and our viewers can see that on uh, on the screen here and be be checking you. Um, but but uh, I'm, I heard that you have been asked to participate in, in the Japan Environmental Film Festival or that you guys are presenting a, a program there. And to me it sounded like you were presenting a, a message of hope. It's kind of like echoing what Dave was saying right, right here. What is that about, the film festival about? Well, on, uh, on Friday, that, that's the, the 1st of July, um, we, were, we were asked to go over and, and be the keynote speaker at the uh, uh, Tokyo Peace Film Festival. Uh, I, I couldn't do that. It didn't make sense to fly all that time for 15 minutes. Aren't, you, put, aren't you anxious to get to Japan? <laughs> I, I, actually, I will be going back at the end of August. It looks oh, like, wow. So, uh, but anyway, um, so we put together a video, which will be up on our site on Friday as well. And you're right. There, there is a message of hope here. The, um, 
the, the Japanese can go back to nuclear power, and um, there's a huge protest movement within Japan right now. They gathered seven million signatures to uh, to stop the firing up these nuclear plants. And just last Friday, there was 45,000 people surrounded the prime minister's house trying to prevent the startup of these nuclear plants. So they have an opportunity here. And, and it's not going to be easy. I, you can't claim that, you know, starting tomorrow, if you put your solar collector up, everything's going to go away. But but they can start a different process, uh, down a different path, you know, with, with solar or wind or alcohol-based fuels and a smart grid. And, and the difference between this century and last century is that we can move power on grids now that we couldn't do back in the 1960s or 1970s when all our nuclear plants were, were built. With computers, we can shift the load to where the powers need it. And you can distribute the generation all over um, a, a country. And I'm, I've been telling the Japanese now for a long time that there's a business opportunity here. If they figure it out for Japan, they can sell it to the rest of the world. The Germans get that message. The Germans are walking away from nuclear within 10 years. And the reason is they've figured out they can make more money selling windmills, selling solar, selling um, the smart grid, selling, you know, anything but nuclear so that if, if there's money to be made and i believe there is um, distributed generation of power is the 21st century way of making power and that was the message we tried to give uh, um, in the video that's going up on friday to the tokyo film festival wow that's that's really that's really powerful and it's interesting that the people of japan how can you have that that much of a population not have say in what's happening to them? I mean, it's just well, incredible. Well, uh, I mean, there are a lot of industrialized countries give way too much power to uh, economic interest to decide political policy, and that's that's a fundamental problem of you know of the degra degradation of democracy, and you get that when there are huge concentrations of money and corruption. I mean, look at the way the government runs in Nigeria. It wouldn't be so such a kleptocracy, you know, if it if it wasn't for oil there. You know, if there wasn't this concentrated wealth that a small number of people had an interest in. So, you know, the people who have an interest in oil or coal or nuclear are small but powerful. And the population has this annoying benefit and, and advantage, but it's not as powerful as money. They have the truth, you know. Like, nuclear power is dangerous, that's the truth. Solar power done properly is cheaper than nuclear, that's the truth. But to break through, for instance, subsidies, uh, you know, other kinds of opposition that's regulatory, uh, you know, refusing to upgrade, as Arnie said, to a smart grid that can take energy from many small sources, you know, those are things that have to be fought at the policy level. and corporations in conjunction with some governments have a lot of say in that versus the public. Yeah, I know I know you're not um, you don't consider yourself a, an advocate Arnie that you're a, an expert witness and you're a, a nuclear engineer and and uh, I think this reflects what Dave's just saying is is that uh, the truth is what we have and it's really great that you're presenting the truth because you don't have to advocate all you have to do is present the truth and let people kind of think this thing through because if you don't have the data and very few people do I, I'm so grateful that your sites there and you and Maggie are working really hard to get this information like Dave working uh, you know you can go to um, the IIEA side Dave's uh, website um, is uh, alcohol can be a gas dot com and uh, we have a lot of uh, discussion of alternative ways of making electricity refrigeration, uh, cooking, of course vehicle power, you know, all these things can be made by, you know, solar-based fuels and, you know, all of them are cheaper than fossil fuels or nuclear. What, what's your uh, takeaway watchword now for the next couple of weeks, Arnie? Do you think we should be concerned, is, is San Onofre uh, done or are we going to see something else happening there? Well. I'm, I am concerned that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is going to allow San Onofre to start back up. Um, they have never shut a nuclear plant down permanently. Um, 
But the, the real solution to, to San Onofre would be to keep it shut down for a couple of years and go in and replace those new steam generators with, with new steam generators. <laughs> uh, but the, of course the problem is that San Onofre committed that they weren't going to spend more than $700 million replacing them. So who's going to give them the next $700 million? Uh, Wall Street doesn't want to touch the deal. And this gets back to the subsidy thing. We're dealing with a technology that, were it not for federal subsidies, wouldn't be subsidized by, by you know, a, a capitalist economy. So what we've done is we've socialized the, uh, the risk. When these things break, we all pay for it. And, and we've capitalized the gain. When they run, it's the, it's the corporations that make the money. It's, um, it's a lose-lose for, um, for the people in Southern California, I'm afraid. Boy, you know, I, I ask uh, Dan Hirsch when, when he was on what, um, who the good guys were in, in power and who could the, the public be communicating with and saying thank you to. And, uh, and Dan just threw his hands up and said, there's, there's nobody that NRC really touches everyone in power and puts the money in po political pockets and, and lobbyists and uh, I don't know, but it's really nice to have the, the concurrence between two very knowledgeable people saying that we do have ways around this. We can boil water in a better way, I think. <laughs> well, let, yes. me, yeah, let me just say one thing. Um, your, your Senator Barbara Boxer has been um, uh, not an advocate of shutting the plant down, but an advocate of a thorough scientific process and holding the NRC's foot to the fire. Uh, so if there's one person out there in California on San Onofre, uh, it would be uh, Senator Boxer's staff that's been instrumental in just making sure that the NRC does their job. You know, we have a quick call. We have a caller online. I'm going to see if we can get them on and, and just, we're running out of time, but caller, can you hear me? We're, ju we're just getting the caller online, guys. And uh... Well, you know, while the caller's coming online, the biggest subsidy for nuclear power, of course, is the Price-Anderson Act, passed many, many years ago, which limits yes, the amount I'm of here. money Can you hear me? that... Uh, let's go to the caller. You have just a moment, please. Caller? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. You, you have a moment with us. Oh, okay. Um, wondering about uh, fish and salmon uh, and contamination from radioactivity from Fukushima. Um, um, what is the feeling? I know that there were tuna caught down around San Diego found to be uh, tainted, and I'm wondering what's going on. Should people stay away from fish caught in the ocean? I'll listen on the internet. Thank we you. We have just a moment. Arnie, do you have a take on that? Uh, yeah, there were uh, scientists caught 15 tuna and every tuna was uh, quite highly contaminated with cesium-134, 137. Wow. So that means every tuna they caught was contaminated. And that speaks, those tuna were only five months after the accident, and they spawned near Japan. So they spawned in Japan, swam across the Pacific, wound up here, we caught them. And then it was about eight months before they published their data, unfortunately. Right. So we've got contaminated tuna, and I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. As citizens, we got to demand that the government test this stuff. But right now, they're on don't ask, don't tell. We, we don't ask the Japanese what's in the tuna, and they don't tell us. Dave, did you? Well, of course, uh, you know, the size of the uh, radioactive pollution from Fukushima dwarfs the pollution from the BP oil spill years, you know, a year ago. So what we're talking about is it'll take time before the radioactive particles in water We'll, we'll move with the currents to our fishing grounds where salmon and stuff will be affected. But when it does come, uh, the whole thing about radioactive particles is they're water soluble. And so they love living things. And they, if you, know, you have smaller creatures eat the radio, uh, radioactive particles, bigger things eat them, bigger things eat them. Now the salmon eats the bigger thing. And all of a sudden you've concentrated by 10 times, because every level eats a lot of food, by the time it gets to you, the radiation content is huge, and tuna are enormous. So they're big bioaccumulators of metals and radiation. Mm -hmm. You've got to realize, though, it's not just the nuclear power plants. It's coal. The whole Pacific Ocean is blanketed every day with mercury 
and radiation from the burning, massive burning of coal in uh, China. So, you know, uh, radiation is in every bit of coal, you know, particles. And so we have multiple sources of bad fuels that we have to end. But the scary part of Fukushima is if that fuel pool burns in days, we will be experiencing exposure via the wind. And uh, it's the immediacy uh, and the severity of what we're talking about with nuclear power that is unmatched in terms of foul sources of power. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be a vegan sometimes, and this is one of those moments I think there's, there's maybe a benefit here for us, but what a crazy, crazy mess. And Arnie, I can't thank you enough. We're down to the wire here. I, I want people to uh, visit you on Fairwinds and Associates. Arnie and, and Maggie are doing fantastic work there, the scientists you're in league with. Dave Bloom, always great to have you on the program, and I'd, I'd love to see the, sh the panel with the two of you together. I think we've got to get you live and in front of the world. This is a very powerful message, so tell your friends, watch. Uh, they can see it online every Tuesday and Thursday, 6 and 10 p.m. We stream live on the internet. We post on Vimeo. This is one of those shows. Last time Arnie was on, we had about 10,000 downloads of the program, so uh, we're really looking forward to getting you guys uh, on and, and the word out. Stay safe and, and uh, think green. Let's, let's think uh, alternative energies for a bit. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Arnie. Dave? Thank you, Tom.